think that will be us for this talk. So, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this time I'll be, uh, again, uh, a speed talker. Yet again, I will be joined by Juan from Igali and Pierre Lou from Valve. We're going to talk today about the releasing and testing process of Mesa. We're going to cover a bit of historical talk and actual current state. So, obviously, uh, details about myself. Should have mentioned Pierre Lou here, sorry. Um, myself, I'm a software engineer at Collabora, I'm working on Mesa since 2011. Pierre, um, Juan is working since 2015, he's from Galia. Uh, here is our agenda, we're going to give you a bit of information about Mesa sort of what's in it, uh, the actual releases we have, how we present them at the moment. We're going to give you some historical talk and how things have evolved in terms of releasing, documentation, and so on. Uh, additionally, we're going to cover the current process. I believe around that stage, Juan is going to join me. He's going to talk about what he's doing at the moment, the test systems we have, we use, some of the stuff they've been doing in the GitLab CI, and at the very end, PLO is going to mention about the work they've been doing with Lunar G. So introduction, um, as you know, Mesa is old. Started back in 1993. Uh, we can, you can describe it as a framework of drivers. It has quite a few of those. This is a small set of APIs that are implemented in Mesa. And as you can see, they are still sizable. Additionally, we have drivers that cover multiple vendors from desktop ones such as Intel, AMD, and NVIDIA to ARM ones such as Qualcomm, Broadcom, etc. Keep that in mind that obviously some drivers are officially supported by the corresponding vendors while others are not. Oh, to top it up, we have four software drivers. Okay, so the releases, we have two types of releases. One of them are feature, other are bug fix releases. The feature releases are roughly four a year, so that's one every three months or so. Uh, we start that by branching off from master, we create a, a branch point, we apply patches more or less every day after a couple of days. We roll a release candidate every week up to the eventual release. We try to keep that around four weeks, although sometimes things run off more since there are regressions. We do our best to provide a tracker where the different teams can list their blockers so that we can easily track both on our end and theirs what's happening and obviously provide some clarity for every distribution and user interested. Um, important part is uh, the, we make no changes whatsoever from the last RC to the actual point zero release so that you know nothing hidden happens, everything's transparent and clear. On the bug fix releases we have a rule, no features whatsoever. We may add PCIs, which is effectively hardware enablement, but no functional changes whatsoever. We try to keep those every two weeks, every fortnight, and as I said, unfortunately we may have the odd delay here and there. Uh, I believe uh, Juan is gonna cover cover some of the obstacles that may cause those. And obviously, we cover bug fix releases for the whole period of the actual feature release. That means we will provide bug fix releases for a period of roughly three months. A um, bit of um, origin and the process, as I mentioned, started with Brian Paul a while ago. Um, obviously, in the very early stages, there's a lot of development there is no documentation, there is no actual strict process. Obviously, most people were hacking for fun. Around Mesa 3.4, things started forming in the ways of uh, having distinct releases, features, and etc. cetera. Uh, as you can see, there were still far and few between, uh, and slowly things have improved. I believe around 2009, Ian Romanek from, uh, from Intel steps in helps out a lot. He improves the quality and frequencies as you can see here. And most importantly, he provides a, excuse me, a clear tag, a clear way to nominate patches. Since up to that point, he was either up to the individual to Brian or via the side channels, which may not be always clear and transparent. Or they might be, but it would be fairly hard to, ha to find out. Um, Shortly afterwards, Carl Wirth, Carl Wirth from Intel steps in to help improve the bug fix releases. 
Um, he does that by, number one, ensuring the volume and the frequency of that. Two is introduces the CC mesos table tag and deprecates the earlier note. For those of you who have done some kernel work, you know that the kernel has a similar notation and it operates the exact same way, such that the release manager can easily fin filter those patches, apply them. Additionally, you have a separate mailing list that is a lot lower volume, and people can nominate at later stage. They can comment in there without the risk of their information getting buried in the volumes you get otherwise on a development mailing list. He also formulates the acceptance criteria, which are also based on the kernel style. Um, he also, at the very end, he documents the process he was using throughout this period before handing it over to me. So I've been doing that more or less since 2014. Um, my main focus was to improve the process in multiple ways. Number one is to ensure that things are documented. Number two is to ensure wide testing. And number three is scalability. Uh, first thing that I mentioned over there is to make sure that you can utilize more than one core. When I started, you can build Mesa only with J1. Um, we didn't build most of Mesa. And today, we more or less built everything with a few very small exceptions. Additionally, originally, things were built only on the release manager's laptop or machine. These days, obviously, we have Travis, have Bayer. Um, personally, I built and with and without DRM because of some interesting interactions. I also built with um, MinGW. I believe um, other guys have extra local testing they perform. Um, as I mentioned, the releasing documentation was a fairly important part since as I started the, let's put it this way, all the information was nicely clumped up in a single HTML file that was like, I don't know, 10 pages long. So I split that up, I enhanced it a fair bit, I cleared up and simplified actually a couple of cases where the developers did not agree upon the acceptance criteria. Additionally, there was a fair bit of work on improving the tooling we use, such that, well, we make tacos, we make mistakes. Quite often we'll, we'll mistype, well, let's say, mess is terrible to mess dev, or we'll, instead of CC, we'll write something else, and those won't flag up. So I fixed a few bugs here and there, and the numbers have improved. Additionally, I've adopted the fixes tag, which is also from the kernel. It provides a, so, a short, short SHA with the actual title, such that if one of those are wrong, we can use the other to infer and to find the exact uh, commit, which has happened. Um, the next step is Andres and Juan from Igalia st started helping out from 17.0. Initially, they were helping with bug fix releases. These days, they are helping out pre pre pretty much everything. Since we moved from a single individual to a group of three, unfortunately, there were some misunderstandings who's doing what. So it became kind of obvious that we want to have information about all of that in, pri uh, in public normally discussed on the mailing list so that everyone is aware of what's happening. There's nothing hidden. There's no shenanigans or anything. Uh, uh, the guys, I believe, Andres improved our scripts even further, where people will unfortunately make other mistakes. So he managed to catch even more fixes that should land, which was great. And as I said, they've been working on GitLab CI, something Juan will cover in a moment. Um, our latest addition to the pool is Dylan from Intel, who's been working since Mesa 18.1, I believe. He's our resident Python expert. He's been helping with Mesa and Piglet and a lot of Python code, improving things drastically. Additionally, there's a very good part that has direct access to the Intel CI, which, as I said, we'll briefly cover it later and later with the talks from Mark James. 
And the is a very interesting topic every now and then. What is this CC? What is fixes? Which one should I use? Do I, should I bother? Should I not bother? What's gonna happen? Is it gonna be? Is my fix gonna be dropped if I change something? What's gonna? What can I remove? What can't I remove? So we we'll have some points here, as you can see, as an outline. In general. Mesostable helps us a lot. Uh, it is something you use if you do not know when the project, the problem occurred. Would that be because it's very complex or would that be because, uh, let's say, historically it's impossible to figure out? Or would that be because it just was broken from so many points and, and just impossible to point out to a particular commit? The fixes itself is, as I said, it's a very nice consistent notation, which I believe on its own is worth using pretty much anywhere and everywhere. A anywhere and, all, and pretty much all the time. The idea is that it provides a clear and consistent way for you and for your fellow colleagues to know when you're referring to a commit. Uh, throughout my experience, I've seen over three different notations in the kernel and over how many, I don't know, notation elsewhere, which makes a very hard reading experience for non-experts in the actual code base. Um, and as I pointed out, uh, it's fairly easy for the maintainer to, ba no, based on that information, it's very easy for the maintainer to pick and apply the patch only where it's needed by default you just throw the fixes tag, you don't need to worry if your patch applies to any stable release or not. Another very important part is that quite often people will need to pick up MESA, whether it be stable or an arbitrary point, and they will want to know when fixes, when things are fixed. So by using this particular notation, they can themselves internally run through our scripts, do additional extra checks, and ensure that they do not hit bugs. The very same bugs fixed with the patches. Uh, obviously, the most important question, when will and how will my, drop, my patch get dropped? My, our intention is to not drop anything silently, even if you self-reject patches. We have this notation of self-rejection, which if we have some time at the very end, I'd like to see how many people are using and how many people think we should keep or drop, since that is causing a bit of confusion every now and then. Our best intent is to apply everything, but as I said, we're human. Sometimes, let's say, there is a typo in denomination. Sometimes we miss something. Sometimes, you know, mistakes happen. Even with the best of tooling, there will be mistakes. Um, the important part at the very bottom is if by any chance your patch is deemed, let's say, not worthy enough or you did not adhere to the acceptance criteria and your patch is rejected, you will be contacted. You will be contacted via email. Quite often you might be poked over IRC and obviously you can say yes, agree with the decision or oh, my bad, I made a typo, and yes, it's not applicable at all, or it's not applicable here, it's applicable there. So we can just double check everything for you, ensure that you have the best actual fixes, uh, the best drivers, and having the, all the fixes applicable to where they need it. Uh, I believe at this point Juan is gonna join me. He's gonna talk about the current uh, way of handling, and shortly afterward, as I said, Pierre Lou is gonna talk. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mir. Um, so after uh, all the process that Emil was describing, uh, now we have a candidate release. Uh, and now the point is, uh, is the release, uh, will work this release? Uh, we have any failures? So uh, basically uh, the first thing we need actually to uh, solve is, uh, is this release going to be buildable? Because uh, in MISA we have different combinations of different options. For instance, we have different uh, build tools, uh, like go to tools, scons, and mison. And then, for instance, in the case of the Gallium drivers, we depend on the LLVM. And the, there is several versions of the LLVM uh, with different APIs. So when you make all the combinations, you need to be sure that uh, everything uh, works fine. 
And of course, uh, we do, as release manager, we, we try to do all these combinations locally, but uh, the thing is that this should be detected as soon as possible, uh, even, uh, even before the release uh, in the master um, branch. So in this case, what we are using is a combination of the uh, GitHub uh, plus Travis uh, plus AP Bayer. Uh, so every time we push a patch on the master, um, this create is a hook that uh, push it to GitHub, and the GitHub uh, tr uh, triggers a build in Travis that basically builds um, uh, different combinations of the different build systems on LVM, and that's in a, a, a major for the Windows system. So uh, in the right screen, you see a, an output of the uh, of the Travis running one of these. Uh, uh, pushes, um, as you, well, probably you can't see, but here there, there is different combinations of different uh, tools, and uh, in green if the bits or not. So this is a first step, but of course it's not enough, uh, because you can have something that is beatable, but then you got what you want to use it, and um, it's completely break, broken. Uh, so we need to do uh, testing, uh, and in this case, uh, uh, the uh, official process right now basically is doing manual testing. Uh, so before doing the release, uh, now that everything is beatable, we just run different test suites, games, or 3D, 3D applications. But of, of course, it's not scalable. Uh, so we need some kind of automated testing. Uh, so here we have uh, two types of different test system we can uh, do. One, use, one is the unit testing. It means that you have uh, test units that try to test if a specific uh, feature or, or works or not. Uh, so you run the test and it fails. It's a regression. It is passes. It's, uh, it's a success. And then they have the functional, functional uh, testing, which means that's like running a game and check for uh, any problem on this. So. Uh, we will focus on the functional testing at the end, now focusing on the unit testing. Thing is that uh, basically we are using the MISA, uh, um, the Intel CI uh, system for MISA. I'm not going to enter in details here because there is a nice talk later by Mark and Clayton. But just to mention that uh, there is a very, very, very powerful uh, and very useful uh, CI system and uh, it's used not only for release managers, but also as developers, uh, you use it a lot. Uh, and uh, it's a basic tool that uh, for us is uh, a must to pass uh, this Intel CI. Thing is that uh, the running this uh, Intel CI it takes a lot of time. Uh, it uses a lot of hardware and resources. Um, so it has several implications. One of them is that um, when we start this process. Uh, sometimes uh, some patches uh, arrive, last minute patches. And we usually try to uh, enqueue these patches for the next releases because we don't want to repeat again the test process because it will be delayed the, the release for sure. Uh, so we only do that if there is a very critical patch that is fixing a real problem in the current release. So that means that we apply in the queue and we resume it, all the work, and restart, and probably we need to delay the, the uh, risk one day. Otherwise, we just um, mark it as nominated patches. Uh, it will be added in the queue for the next release, but we inform the authors that these are, uh, these are good patches, but we will not enter in this, in this process. This is done in the, in the email uh, in the section uh, nominated patches which basically means that uh, your patch is fine, but uh, we can't, um, it, it arrives late. The other thing um, is that, uh, as I said, it takes a lot of time, and uh, basically uh, we don't want to send uh, anything to the Intel CI before doing a previous quality checking, uh, which means that basically that we want to do first uh, running our tests locally, very limited uh, kind of, of tests, and then if everything is fine, then we submit it to the Intel CI. So for doing this, this testing, uh, as I said, uh, so far we are using the combination of Travis CI and API. Uh, as you 
might uh, notice the, this uh, system only allows you to build system, to build um, to test the building of the release, but it can't test because at the end you need real hardware to do the testing. And the Travis and AP Bayer is using uh, virtual hosts which don't have a real hardware. Uh, thing is, besides that, uh, now in free desktop we have uh, GitLab, which was uh, nice explained by Daniel in the previous talk. And among the features, it has the continuous, uh, continuous integration system, uh, its own CI. So basically, we don't need to rely on Travis CI uh, and GitHub, but we can use the GitLab uh, uh, system. And has other many features that we will explain later that uh, it helps us to, um, to improve the, the, the test system. So uh, even before that free test moved to GitLab, uh, we were using the, inside the Galia, uh, for the releases, we were using the GitLab.com um, to do the, the build and testing system um, before uh, sending to Intel. So, as I said, it was only used for preparing the releases, uh, and uh, the idea is, is, okay, we have uh, get uh, add patches on the on the candidate release, push it to GitLab.com. It runs a lot of tests. It give uh, tell us, okay, this is a regression here. It's not a regression. If everything is fine, we continue, and when we have a, a real good, uh, or at least, uh, at least um, some, some quality uh, uh, candidate release, then we uh, push to the Intel CI. So basically, we uh, use this uh, more or less every day or every two days, and then uh, before uh, send, uh, sending the pre-announcement, we submit everything to the Intel CI, which will take time, but it will give, okay, this correct. So this way, uh, we uh, um, don't uh, waste time from Intel people uh, to do this testing. So when we were moving to the GitLab CI, we have uh, something we would like to change. It was, uh, with Travis, basically the idea was, okay, you run the, your, you take your code, you build in, in Travis, everything is fine. Now for testing, you take the code, you clone the code in each of the hosts uh, that are you going to test, you build Mesa there, then you build uh, the test suite you are going to use in each of the hosts, and then you test. And really, you are, if you think about it, is you are um, wasting a lot of time because you are building the same thing several times when we, just building once will be enough. And this is special important when you use uh, for testing uh, hosts that are not so powerful, like you have uh, some Nuke that is not very powerful, but are cheap and you can have different uh, cards uh, so basically you want uh, just to only use it for testing or for running for the MISA. And the other thing is that, and it happened, is that uh, on each host sometimes you have different uh, versions of the software, like different distros or different, uh, even in the same distro, different versions of the distro. And sometimes you have some libraries installed on one system, other libraries in other systems that enable some features. And then when you are trying to compare, there is like this um, different software is like uh, influencing in the, in, the, in the results. So what we like is, okay, let's build the same thing once and just take it, everything, uh, you mean uh, MISA uh, and the all dependencies, put it in, in the test system and um, run out the tests. So the only difference is about, well, beside the kernel, the only difference is that uh, it's only the hardware. All the software is the same. So thinking about this, uh, also, there is a, the other problem, which is, uh, well, we have we need a way of how to um, have this uh, encapsulate uh, binaries uh, in an uh, easy to uh, distribute system. Um, and um, here, uh, and Docker uh, really helps a lot uh, using containers. GitLab is, is, has a nice integration with Docker, so Docker is a really good way to just yes, to put uh, your uh, blob. Uh, uh, already built in a very contained system, and then using the register of GitLab, very easy to pull it and install on the, all the systems. And the other f uh, thing that is nice, as Docker is the build of Docker is, um, uh, is contained in a single Docker file, or is very easy to uh, reproduce locally uh, the containers. And this is something that, as release manager, we do a lot of times when we find problems. We just take the container and sometimes we rebuild the container locally and we get exactly the same 
uh, version of the container. So uh, we, are using, we are using the same approach as in Travis, that is check different combinations of the build tools and the LVM versions. Uh, just to ensure that everything uh, builds. Uh, in this case, we are not, I mean, while we are using Docker image, we are not using Docker itself for building. Uh, the thing is that on one side, it, this lot of combinations uh, makes quite difficult to write a Docker file that is uh, simple enough to uh, combine the, those different options and the Docker uh, file syntax is quite uh, rigid. On the other hand, uh, is that um, to speed up the building, we want to uh, cache uh, the build using Ccache or something like that. And in Docker, unfortunately, you can't build, um, uh, you can be, um, oh, sorry, um, external directories on build time. Uh, so it basically makes it difficult to uh, have a way of improving the, the build system. So here we are using Rocker, which basically is a uh, Go tool. It's a single binary tool, which is you can download it, and you don't need any uh, dependencies, so it's very easy to use in any di di distro. And the, basically, it provides these two features. Uh, it provides uh, templating, and it provides uh, mounting on build time. So with, with this, we just uh, speed up the system, uh, make the uh, things easier. Uh, so uh, the idea is that we create here different image. At the end, we, the, all the images contain the same uh, software, that is the, the drivers we want to test, but it does using different combinations on, on uh, using scones or using auto tools with different NVM. In order to test, only once is required, only one of these images. So basically just, we just drop the other image. Uh, we, it, they are only used for checking if things be correctly and we push to the registry the image that contains the, all the drives you want to test. Uh, another thing we were doing regarding the Travis is that, uh, as you know, in, in MISA we have the, the minimum dependencies for, um, to build MISA, and it is very nice uh, to build MISA using these minimum dependencies because it's easy to detect that uh, it's a dependency is too old uh, just to boom up in the uh, build tool to say, okay, now I need this library version uh, plus one. Uh, but of course, the problem is that you are inst installing the dependencies, all the package in Debian, everything, every time you make a push, and it takes a lot of time. So as in Docker, basically you can uh, start from a, a, a init image and then uh, add your, uh, your code and your, like in this case, Misa, instead of starting from uh, Ubuntu, which is what uh, Travis is doing actually, we just create a, a base image system. And uh, this base image system is like a Docker image that contains everything uh, you need to build Misa. And it's only built once. Um, and uh, well, it's only built once except if you change dependencies. So when you change dependencies, the, we create another base image. And so basically it speed up the system because you don't need to uh, rebuild all the time the, uh, the image. And also, uh, as part of the base image are packaged from Ubuntu, in this case, we just uh, force a review once per week, so we ensure that the base image is always updated with the last versions of the uh, distribution uh, package. So uh, here, um, there is, um, well, uh, this is the, the pipeline. Um, in the, the first two columns, well, the first column is the base system, which uh, just takes an, an Ubuntu distro and install all dependencies uh, either from package or from the source code like we are doing in Travis. Then from that, that image, we create several different images with different versions of LVM. Uh, the reason why we separate those images is on one side because this way we reduce the size of the image when you want to test against LVM 5.0, you don't need to pull uh, all the versions of LVM. That's on one side. And the other is, is that we ensure that in that image, the, we only have LVM 5.0 and not other versions that could uh, mess up uh, the system. So as I said, this uh, system basically uh, is just build once. Uh, every time you push, it checks uh, if there is changes in dependencies. If not, it just go uh, up to the next uh, step. And the next step basically is building MISA. Uh, well, basically it's building different uh, combinations of the other tools, uh, sorry, the build tools like SCOS, LVM, uh, so on, and different versions of LVM. Uh, 
So when this uh, finalizes, um, actually we only keep one of these images. I think it's the first one is the is pushed to the uh, GitLab registry. The other one is just removed. We have another step, which is uh, there is um, one of the job which is the disk check job. Basically, this, this, this check, as, as, you, as you can uh, figure out, just uh, runs this check, which creates the uh, a candidate release uh, uh, tarball. Uh, this check, what it does is create the tarball, and then it tries if it builds with make. But as I said, we have other build tools. So what we do is in the tarball uh, stage with the fourth one, basically we take this um, the tarball generated for, from, from the check and we just try to rebuild it using all the build tools. So we ensure that, of course, nothing is missing in, in, the, in the final tarball. Um, okay, so this is for building and now we need the next step, which is now how to test. And uh, as I said, we need real hardware to do the testing. And the, this is where really uh, GitLab uh, shines. Because uh, in GitLab, uh, usually they provide several runners that are choosing to run your jobs, but you can provide your own, uh, your own runner. Uh, you have your, your project, you can go there and, uh, and say, okay, I want my own runner, which basically means I will take my host or laptop or whatever you want and, and say, okay, I want to use my, my, uh, my host to run jobs. And uh, of course, uh, well, the thing is that the way it works uh, basically is like, well, GitLab provides different ways of running. Uh, the case we use is using a combination of Docker. That is, uh, we just, in GitLab running is run by using uh, Docker mounting the graphics device. So we have access to the, um, to the uh, hardware, to the uh, graphics hardware. And then basically when, when the, um, the test is going to start. It takes this image from the GitLab, uh, GitLab registry, which is the image we contains MISA, mounts with these uh, options, and then uh, runs the, the test system. Uh, the way to uh, tell, okay, I want to uh, use this specific hardware using basically tags. So, uh, for instance, we have a, a Skylake host. Uh, uh, then we uh, annotated in the docker, okay, this is a host used for testing, and the, I add tags like uh, test with OpenGL, test with Vulkan, this is Skylake, uh, and then in the jobs, uh, we use also uh, tags to match. So for instance, I say, okay, for the testing, I want to use a Skylake machine. So we will check for a, a runner that have a Skylake, a Skylake um, tag, we could be, you can have several hosts, this is the, the free ones, and run the test. So how this is basically working? Uh, the thing is that you run the, um, the MISA, when it finalizes, it triggers a build on the test suite uh, you want to, to, to test. Basically, we have all the test suites in the, in the GitLab uh, repository, so uh, and basically we're using the same approach as in this uh, case for MISA. So as an example, um, uh, the test uh, system basically triggers the, which is the, the, the fifth one, triggers uh, test Crucible or OpenGL CTS from Kronos, Vulkan CTS or Pilic. So the output of these triggers, which is basically calling an, uh, an API, a webhook, uh, creates these downstream operates, which basically is just uh, running the, those external operates. So when you click on, on one of them, which is something nice from GitLab. In this case, I, I click on Piglet. I can browse to the Piglet repository and see uh, what is the building happening. So it, it, it shows me, me that this uh, build is coming from uh, this uh, job in MISA. So what it do, does here is just take this uh, uh, image created in this MISA, uh, creates another image adding Piglet. This, the, as I said, this is the build step. And then it runs the tests. And running the tests uh, is running in several, uh, with several drivers. And uh, it just takes the, the image with the build, uh, build uh, and start to, to execute it. So basically, this uh, shows in green when the uh, test uh, suite is, is finalized, or in red if there was some problem and the test suite could be run. Now, for knowing the error regressions, uh, basically, we are running all the, this test uh, system. Uh, 
test suite, sorry, are integrated with Piglet. So we use Piglet just to create nice HTML files, and um, which are uh, export as an artifact in GitLab, which is another feature. And the thing is that in order to know if there is problem or not, what we do is just the same pipeline you see before are used for when we make our release, but uh, we use a very simplified version of this uh, pipeline. So this pipeline basically run, does the same and generates the piglet results. And those piglet results are used as uh, reference uh, tests when we use, the, in this case, the pre-release version. Uh, so basically, we just need to only know if this um, is some problem or not. In this case, for instance, uh, well, I don't know if you can see it, but here is uh, the output in the black screen. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the right, there is the artifacts. We will remove it in three months. You can download the artifact, which is basically is the result of the pill, or you can uh, browse uh, on it. You click on the browse, and you go through uh, and see the results of the XML, or sorry, the HTML. So uh, ignore the names of the columns, but uh, the thing is that we have the, the, release, the last release version on one side and the current candidate release version. So in this case, there are uh, three uh, regressions. So basically one go there and check what happened. Maybe it could be a false positive and so on. So doing that, uh, basically we have a minimum quality system uh, that we uh, know that uh, the release, the candidate release uh, is, uh, I mean, it has some, uh, at least some quality. Um, so after do that, we just submit the, uh, the candidate to, release to the Intel CI system just to make uh, uh, a more exhaustive uh, test. Because, I mean, no, I mean, there are some times that we don't, there are more combinations like using 32 bits and things like that that we are not testing. But at least we have some uh, kind of, of um, quality and it really helps uh, to Intel and for us. So that's for unit testing. Then they are the, the functional testing, which is basically takes uh, uh, a game, run it, and check if there are problems or even regressions. But uh, for this part, um, Pierre Loop will uh, explain it. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll be quick because we're running out of time, but uh, it's just a quick follow up from last year. Um, so a couple of years ago, we uh, kind of kicked off uh, an internal test suite for our own consumption. Uh, this one approaches a problem from the other side, right? We don't do unit testing. Uh, instead, we only test uh, traces from real Steam games. So the main purpose for us is uh, you know, to determine if a driver is good to ship or if it's gonna uh, regress any games. Um, we also do performance testing, but it's not a benchmarking suite. Uh, since it's trace-based, you can't really rely on the number uh, that it's gonna um, give you to be useful for you know what you would get on your own machine running the game. Uh, instead, the number is only useful relative to you know previous numbers. Um, so uh, last year, I talked about opening the results to the public um, and also opening the possibility of pre-release testing. So people have been able to submit their own branches uh, for you know advanced testing, but we also test. Uh, all the point releases. Um, so here's some progress we made since last year. We have a performance dashboard. It's pretty dark here. Uh, you can see our hardware configurations there. Um, we also added NVIDIA configurations that should uh, show up soon. We've been testing internally with them and it's actually been really useful. Um, so we're also opening up these results to the public. Um, so this is a quick kind of at a glance, you know, performance number. Uh, you see all the point releases that have been tested on the left. Uh, so all that stuff is open to the public now. You can dash, uh, you can browse to that uh, share that Learnergy website and uh, come through the results yourself. Um, so one of the big things since last year is we've added Vulkan testing. Uh, VK Trace wasn't quite up to speed uh, this time last year, but you know we've been pushing on it hard. That's really important for us to start testing that as more and more games are starting to rely on it. Um, so same, same idea, uh, we're still ramping up test configurations, but you know, it's coming along. Um, if you want to do your own testing, uh, your own pre-release testing, there's a you know, new test run page. Uh, you can throw your repo, if it's a GitHub branch or whatever, uh, throw in the SHA there. You can run a subset of the test, you can pick a subset of the hardware configurations. 
uh, and you can request that you know, your results be private, you'll be notified by email, or just have them up in the public as another test run. Um, one of the changes we've made uh, you know, from feedback is that now the test results are uh, able to can be compared against any other test results. So there is a maintained baseline, baseline where you know, someone will come through the results and call a, you know, a given thing golden based on no regression. So you can you know, have a, at a glance result from whatever is the latest res uh, release that was tested successfully, but you can also compare to previous releases yourself. Um, and you can do image results that actually one of the main things that we test for for regressions. Uh, it tells you the pixel diff so you can get an at a glance idea or if it's just you know, a sampling error around edges or if it's a, a major thing. And there's uh, various visualizations to uh, browse through the results. Uh, again, all that stuff is accessible. You can you know, browse to it and, and go comb through these results for existing test runs uh, right now. Uh, performance results are you know, same idea. We loop uh, one frame repeatedly, we get you know, a number Again, it's only relative to the, it's only useful relative to previous numbers, but it's really useful to find regressions, both on the CPU side and GPU side. Um, so that's it, thank you. Any question? I guess, uh, uh, questions? Yeah. You mentioned rebuilding based on when dependencies change. I wonder, um, you know, how do you guys know strictly the dependencies? For, for us, a, a small change to libdrm can mean we have to rebuild everything, or a lot of times there's some kind of dependency between, um, like we have to update X and to have it work with new patches to Mesa, or especially in the Vulkan um, sphere, there's tons of dependencies between these little tools that commonly break. So when you get a check-in to GLS Lang, like how do you know which Docker images you have to go and rebuild? So Quan's gonna answer that one, but in general, I've been diving through libdrm and X and back and forth, and I'm mostly aware when breaks, is breakages happen and I try to ping individuals, would I build like driver specific or general distribution so they always make sure things are updated, but you're right, we should have some clearer information. Juan? Yeah, um, also this um, is, is worth to know that this uh, dependency list is hard writing in the Docker file. Um, so it's not, um, I mean, the system is not uh, guessing what is the dependency, but it's like in Travis, you have the list of, of software and you have the list of, of versions to build, and we do the same. And uh, the thing is that if just, uh, when we build and there is a broken, th break, broken thing, we just check, okay, this was because now we need this version, so we update it. But it's not uh, done automatically. It's like, to avoid to repeat, Installing all the time the same version of the same pa of the package, the same version of the dependency, just avoid that. Yeah, I mean, it seems like that would be really good to, if you could automate the dependencies between the Docker images so that you know you get the right one, and especially if you want to go back and test a stable branch, you need to have the right, you know, prerequisite. Um, images working together. I also wonder about IO. Um, how does, um, it, it, it sounds like you, you have separate Docker images maybe for Piglet and then for Mesa, and then you can, you know, the different test systems can pull them down independently, so you don't always have to get a new Mesa when you get a new Piglet image. Um, I wonder how the total IO um, profile compares to just, um, you know, building and deploying uh, a build route to the system. Um, I'm not sure if I got the, the question. So you mean how, how we know which version of the uh, image to pull or? Well, I mean, it, it, I guess when you, have, when you have Docker images with the, the you know, binaries that you compiled, um, is it um, much worse or different from, from like just our syncing over, you know, your, your built files, um, I mean, this is what, what we just manually, you know, move files between the systems for test, and I wonder how Docker affects the, um, you know, the file I.O. Uh, between your builders and your testers. I 
I don't think I'm getting the question really. Uh, the quality of sound is very bad. Are you interested why he's using Docker as opposed to, let's say, rebuilding it locally every time, no, I mean, or sync, or any other means? Yeah, I'm considering using Docker myself. Why I'm Docker? wondering, the big bottleneck is I.O. Oh, okay, to the system, okay. right? We and are so. not rebuilding because, in our case, uh, the hardware are quite limited in, 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 in the speed and the memory. And we notice that every time we want to try to test what we were doing before using cron tabs in the night, it would take a lot of time. Uh, building, uh, consumes a lot of space in the disk, uh, and, and as I said, in a couple of times we noticed that, oh, there is here, this works, and here, but doesn't work there. Okay, maybe it's the hardware, this support, and uh, no, it's not the hardware, it's because there was a library installed here that was uh, getting a feature that is not in the other place. So, uh, basically the thing is that, okay, with this sim system, we can uh, buy for testing only, uh, cheap uh, devices, uh, cheap hosts we, with different cards, uh, stack, stack them, uh, and that's used as a, a test system. Uh, the build, in, I mean, running the, the build, which is quite a, a CPU uh, demanding, uh, is not going to happen here. So we can't use uh, systems that are very, uh, with very low powerful, only the, the, the power required to run the tests. And uh, also we can't just go there, um, drop all the image, and you have the system clear. Uh, so we are uh, messing up with the system lock, um, I mean with the destroys installed locally, uh, with, uh, with the uh, dependency we need, uh, basically. Basically, that's the point. To... And, and so finally, um, one of the problems I have is testing end-to-end uh, -end compression, because the dependencies in X that we don't have um, in, our, in the distro we use, and so, do you guys build X um, or up-to-date versions of X and deploy those in, in, in containers so you can test that as well? Yeah, um, well, as I, when I was playing the, um, uh, here, uh, let me, sh well, okay. Uh, don't know how to go back, anyway. Um, uh, when you install the Docker runner, one of the things we, uh, as I said, we, do you install the, um, uh, the mark the, the mount the, all the requirements to run the, to get access to the hardware to the graphics hardware. Well, another thing we use is uh, just also mount all the required things um, just to get access to the X, XR running or Western running. Uh, we have other we um, probably we have a different uh, version. We basically uh, we get the X running in a container and then link both containers. Uh, but r right now, as we are all using the, the X for testing, we just mount all the uh, links uh, required inside the test image. So basically, it means that when you run the, uh, the test, uh, it's running against the X that's running outside the, uh, the, the, you know, in the host itself. Um, but yeah, even you could uh, run the X in the different container, because the, the ways if something is happens like the X broke or whatever you are test, in the next uh, step will be re, re, uh, restart the, uh, the this container with the X or with Wayland, whatever you want to use, and then link both together with with uh, by mounts on these uh, features that uh, Docker has, like uh, M bars or something like that. Any other question? You do a lot of testing in different hardware and so on. Um, do, you, do you get lots of false positives, like tests that are failing now after some change, but um, the, the test is buggy and so on and, and makes you waste a lot of time? And if so, do you have any ideas for how to improve um, the test um, reliability. Okay, so, so the question is if uh, we, when running we have some uh, failures and then it turns out that there are uh, false positives, right? Yeah, uh, yes, we have, it happens a lot of times. Um, and the thing is that in this uh, um, pipeline, we have like a filter where we just remove all the tests that are, uh, I mean, you know, there are tests that takes a lot of time, like sometimes I found tests that takes 
10 hours to run. Um, there are other times that there are the flaky tests that today works, tomorrow no, doesn't work, and it's like, whoa. Um, the thing is that this is not a system. We only want to have a minimum quality just to submit to the Intel CI. Uh, and the Intel CI is probably uh, handling this better than us. Uh, so we just filter those, those tests. So yeah, at the first, we were having those problems, then go to the machine, say, okay, this test is quite problematic, mark it as don't execute it, uh, because it's, it's really uh, creating, and then only keep a, a, san, a sanitized uh, uh, version of the tests, uh, you know, as, um, as, as, as a group of, of sanitized tests just to uh, use it. So it's done in the, in, the, in, the, in the test suite, one of the things that, okay, don't test against these tests. If, one, if you want BKCs on this, how to handle flaky tests, please come to the, the testing workshop. I'm going to talk about this because for IGTN on Intel, there's a lot of them. So we dealt with them pretty effectively and, and managed to actually fix them because flaky tests need to be fixed also. My question is about uh, if you know, are aware or know about some implementation, let's say for the inspection of the output of display done uh, automatically by means of uh, optical recognition. Uh, because in some cases uh, you may have very good test results, but then you can have or see glitches, uh, say in video or artifacts. Uh, and they are not always uh, visible in, in the test result, uh, maybe a piglet uh, or CTS. And uh, I wanted to ask uh, if there is some uh, so open implementation that can help and if it could be integrated in this uh, testing process. Thank yeah, um, right now our test system is quite uh, simple. I mean, it, it takes a lot of jobs, but it's quite simple. Uh, it only use uh, piglet tests so if there are things like, uh, oh, this is an artifact here, uh, and Pili can detect it uh, because for, uh, for Pili is a pass, for us it's also a pass. Uh, I hope that probably in the Intel CI system they can detect these kind of things. Or the other thing is that it's, you can probably detect these things maybe on the Lunar G system that besides the performance, it shows you a difference and you can see for it in, in games like, oh, this is not rendered correctly. Supposedly, this should be detected in the, in the, when you run Vulkan tests and uh, when you run OpenGL, sorry, OpenGL or Vulkan, depending on the game, or using Piglet. But, I mean, there are all the time, there are um, corner cases that maybe it was covered by a test and uh, um, shows up in the, in the game. But, of course, uh, this is a much simpler system, uh, so we don't detect it. We're running a bit out of time. Maybe time for last question. Anybody? Okay, remember there is a workshop just after lunch related to the graphics testing. Thank you very much. Thank you.